Psalm 134. Before we go to the Lord and hear from him, <clears throat> let's go to him in prayer and once more ask his blessing upon the hearing, the reading, and the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Our heavenly gracious God, we come again before you and we come now to you and we are eager to hear your word. We come to sit at your feet and be still and to listen. And we pray, Heavenly Father, help us to settle our souls and our focus uh, help us, or help us to, 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 uh, uh, to be clear and to listen. Lord, help us to receive from you that which is most important, your word. For because it is there that you give us yourself, your grace, your blessing, your kingdom. And it's for all of these that we yearn and we long. Open our, our eyes, we pray now, and hearts that we might accept by faith all that we hear, that it may change our lives and our hearts, and that we would be transformed into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. We come this morning to Psalm 134. This is the last Psalm of the Songs of Ascent that we have been uh, going through this past number of weeks. Uh, so please give your full attention now as we hear from our God, our great and gracious Lord, the God who is not silent. Please give your full attention now to the reading of his word. Psalm 134. A song of ascents. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. For the reading of God's word, may he indeed add his blessing upon it. Well, we come this morning, as I mentioned, <clears throat> to the end of the journey of our pilgrim that we've been looking at uh, these past number of weeks. We've been looking at these psalms, Psalms 120 to 134, the songs of ascent. And we can't be completely certain, but it's likely that this, this group of psalms was collected together in the history of the Old Testament and put together. Uh, they're like a kind of prayer book or song book um, as they made the trip, these pilgrims, um, the people of God from their various towns and villages to the Holy Land for the festivals uh, in Jerusalem. We've now arrived at the end of our journey, uh, at the last of these Psalms. Um, a friend of mine pointed out the sense of sadness uh, that we have when we come to the end of a series that we've been meditating upon and dwelling upon for some time, and that's certainly how I feel uh, as we say farewell to our pilgrim, and as he mounts back up and heads back home. Uh, as we've uh, been looking at these psalms, we've seen that they are kind of a guide, a uh, survival guide, if you will, to the Christian life, we the people of God. And we've seen in our pilgrim, uh, we've seen our pilgrim on his journey go up, and we've seen the go through various feelings and emotions as he does so even as we go through the various emotions and feelings in our pilgrim lives. This pilgrim had headed out, leaving home, and he was quite discouraged at his environment. That environment uh, was more and more hostile towards God and more and more hostile towards God's word and God's people. Uh, for instance, in Psalm 120, we read, Too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace but when I speak, they are for war. And he's saying that he is for peace and the people around him are hostile. They are against God and the things of God. And we see this thread throughout these Psalms and indeed, we see it throughout the course of history. That's one of the things about sin and the outworking of sin amongst people. There is hostility, there's animosity towards God and God's people. And there's never, of course, been a time, and right now, is true as well, where God's people couldn't identify with this very thing, with this pilgrim of the Song of Ascents, Songs of Ascent. Uh, and as believers in Jesus Christ, we seek to live consistently within our worldview. We seek to be honest and gracious and to love others and to speak truth. And we can in many ways identify with this pilgrim uh, on his way and back again. And he said that he is for peace, the peace of the Lord. But Jesus seems to be 
hated in this world more and more. So what has our pilgrim done? Well, he's gone to church. He's gone to church, and it's likely he's been there for the whole week, and during this time he's meditated upon the work of God, and he's at the church in Jerusalem. And he's reflected upon God's blessing, and he's full of gratitude. And like we do, he's reflected and thought through the experience when we come to a glorious and heartfelt worship service amongst the people of God. And we feel simultaneously right, that unworthiness to be before the Lord because of our sinfulness, but also the wonder and glory of the gospel and that new way that's been made, that's been opened by Jesus Christ for us to boldly go into the presence of our Heavenly Father. And this pilgrim has gone through these things and he's come to the end of the week of celebration and praise. And his significant spiritual experiences are coming to an end. And what is he to do? What does he say? How is he to respond as he, he's about to make his way home? Well, as we look at this psalm, uh, Psalm 134, we see that it's made up of three verses, very brief, but there are really two sections of this psalm. Uh, most believe it was likely originally spoken by two voices, right? the voice of the pilgrim as he leaves to go back home, and then the voices of those to whom he is speaking. Right? There's the voice of the pilgrim, and then the voice of those he's addressing. In verses 1 and 2, he's addressing the servants of the Lord. You see that in verse 1. Uh, these are probably the priests, the ones who minister in the temple in Jerusalem. And he wants to offer them a parting word. And then in verse 3, in response to him, those ministers, those servants of the Lord, offer to him a parting word. And as the ministers, those servants say goodbye, and the pilgrim leaves at the end of his pilgrimage. It's their last word to him as he returns home from Jerusalem. Because they are aware that this pilgrim, like us, when we are in the presence of the Lord on his day, and we've been encouraged after we've uh, been taught from God's word, we've heard the Lord, and he's been reminded again of his forgiveness. We know that we have to descend back down from spiritual Mount Zion, back into the world, back to our problems and our failures and our inadequacies. How is the pilgrim going to manage when he went home? So let's look at this psalm now. We'll look at these two things from the psalm. First, the pilgrim's parting words to the ministers, and then the minister's parting, word, uh, parting words to the pilgrim. These ministers, you know, the servants of the Lord, as he calls them, are the servants we read about in the Old Testament, uh, particularly 1 Chronicles 9. Uh, we read about these ministers there, and they are the ones responsible for caring for the temple and the worship of God during the day and during the night. And so the psalm says in verse 1, Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Right? Not just in the daytime, but also in the night. Right? Verse 1, Come bless the Lord. In verse 2, Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. And there are some very significant things that he is unfolding here. And one of those things is that the pilgrim has a deep concern for the glory of God, right? for God's glory, even when others are not conscious of the, God, of the glory of God. And this is the real marvelous thing. This reveals the heart of the pilgrim in all that he does. The most significant thing for him, the most significant thought is that God would be glorified and revered and adored. And that's something for all of us as well. As well. From the rising of the sun and into the night, and for all of our lives, the central leading desire, as it was for the pilgrim, was that God would be glorified. This is, this is what brought him joy, and it should bring us joy as well, the glory of God. And of course, we have a very strong central drive in this regard, right? It's our first question and answer of our catechism, right? What is the chief end of man? What is man's primary purpose? What is his chief end? And that answer is so simple, yet so profound. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And this man has comprehended this very thing. And, you know, this is so uh, con contra, um, you know, so opposite of the, the thinking of the world. Right? Some people believe, many believe, that those two things 
are opposite of one another. They're opposed to one another, glorifying God and enjoying anything. And some people, when they hear the gospel and the call to believe and to bow the knee to Jesus, they think and fear that giving themselves over completely to the Lord, that they will lose everything, especially any joy in their lives. But as you know, actually, the very opposite turns out to be the case. And this is what makes possible this pilgrim. As he gives these parting words, it's what enables him to say to those ministering at the temple in the nighttime and in the daytime, he says his greatest desire is that even when he sleeps, that God would be glorified to the ends of the world. And then also notice that his concern is not only that the Lord be glorified, even in those hours when he's not awake, but he also asks for prayer when he will be away back on his own. Again, look at verse 2. He says, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. This, of course, is a posture of prayer. Right? These people of God very often stood while they prayed, and they would stand and with their eyes open and their hands raised and lifted up. And they longed for God to fill their hands and to bless them. And the pilgrim has been in the city of God, but now it's time to go. And what he's asking the ministers to do is to pray for him and to bless the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless Yahweh. You might know that this is one of the most repeated uh, exhortations in the Psalms. Right? Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord. All throughout the Psalms. And it may seem strange to us to hear and to say, um, and it seems obvious that God, of course, can bless us. We need his blessing. But how can we bless him? Well, I think as you get older, and particularly as you have children, children are a blessing to you. They're a blessing. And when they make things for us, uh, for their parents, like a drawing when they're small, or some other art project, uh, we don't throw those things in the trash because they're not very good art. Right? We know that in their small way, they're trying to show love for us. And our hearts are full of joy as they do this, and they bless us, and we treasure them. And the pilgrim here is saying that this is how glorious and gracious our God is, that his people are able to bless him and to bring him joy and to make him smile upon us, the people of God. And you see, this is the psalmist's longing the manifestation of God's glory in the world and enjoying the Lord and for the ministers to lift up their hands and to pray, to pray for him and to bless the Lord. Here is one of God's children who's been delighted and satisfied in the Lord and he desires that everyone give themselves over to the Lord for their good and for his glory. And that's to be our desire as well, right, brothers and sisters? That's to be our desire in our satisfaction. Is that your desire? Is that, is that, is that the, the, the desire and the longing of your heart, the glory of God? In all things and in every place, in all that you do and all that you say, and is Jesus the fullest satisfaction of your heart? Are things that complete with him, that compete with him for your deepest satiation and satisfaction? I pray that there is not... And when we find that there is, oh, I pray that it would be removed from your lives. Your King and Savior will have no competitors. He is your all. He must be your all. Because apart from Him, there is no satisfaction or peace or joy. But in Him, there is rest and peace and joy, true joy, true lasting satisfaction. In Christ alone. So those are the pilgrim's parting words to the minister. And the next we see the minister's parting word to the pilgrim. Verse 3, right? He says, May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. And listen to what's going on here. Right? You may recognize this. This is a prayer, but it's a benediction. Right? It's a benediction. May the Lord bless you from Zion. And you're all familiar with the benediction, right? This, the benediction that closes our service each Lord's Day. And the benediction isn't a prayer so much as it is a pronouncement upon the people of God. 
And so when we have a guest to come and they're not yet ordained, he's not supposed to offer a benediction. He's to offer a closing prayer or a sending prayer. But a benediction is a pronouncement upon the people of God from the Lord. And it's completely appropriate to stand and to receive with eyes open. Because at that time, we're not praying or asking for the blessing of God. What we're saying is that God has commanded upon us his blessing. And that's his blessing to us. May the Lord bless you from Zion. From Zion. Why the addition of that? It's because it's the blessing that he had before God, the forgiveness of God, pictured in the sacrifices at the temple. And that blessing is not only for that hour of that week or for that week in which it happens. It's not only for there in Jerusalem. No, it's a benediction from the Lord that follows you all throughout your life. And he's saying, may the Lord bless you from Zion as you go down from Zion. And that which you experienced in Zion, may that flow down and flow down and be upon you for all of your life. And as you're familiar with your Bibles, you know that there is this, one of those threads and themes that we find is a mighty river that runs through Jerusalem. Right? We read this from Psalm 46 a moment ago in our Old Testament lesson. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the Most High. Or in Ezekiel, for instance, we read about the mighty river flowing from the temple. And we read in Ezekiel chapter 47 of this mighty river. And it says this, I'll read briefly from the beginning of the chapter, Ezekiel 47. It says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate, and he led me around outside uh, to the outside, the outer gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the water was trickling out of the south side and going eastward, with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits, and he led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. And again he measured a thousand, and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. And again he measured a thousand, and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. And again he measured, and it was a river that I could not pass, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the banks of the river. And as I went back, I saw the bank of the river, very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. And when the water flows into the sea, water will become fresh. And wherever the river, the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish for this water goes there, and the waters of the sea become fresh. So everything will live where the water goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from En Gedi to En Galaim. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be the very, of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food, and their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water, for, the water for them flows from the sanctuary. There will, their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. The mighty river from the temple. But you probably know there is no river in Jerusalem. So what's this about? Well, we read in our New Testament reading from John 7, where he said, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. 
the one who believes in Jesus, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And John says this is the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives to those who believe in him. And this is what's pictured here. It's the blessing that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit from the very heart of God to his people. May the Lord bless you from Zion. And there's something else here to consider from this benediction that we read. Uh, likely most of you are familiar, um, the most familiar benediction in Scripture uh, is the one that we often close our service with, the Aaronic the benediction from Numbers chapter 6. Where it says this, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and the sons and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. And you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. This was the command to the priest to pronounce upon the people of God. It's the blessing of God. And the pilgrim knows. He's seen in Jerusalem the sacrifices and how that peace comes to him. And we know, brothers and sisters, from this side of the resurrection, that it all pointed to Jesus, the full and final atonement that he would make through the sacrifice of his own body on the cross. And remember the first words that Jesus said to the disciples after the resurrection. Do you remember what they were? The first words that he says as he appears before them. John chapter 20. It says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad that they saw it when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. And you can see him, right? You can see him, Jesus, the great high priest, lifting up his hands towards the people, and he gives them the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Ephesians 2, we read, Jesus, he is your peace. He is our peace. And notice also the benediction that the ministers pronounce in verse 3 of Psalm 134. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Right? Do you see that? And they're telling this pilgrim, as you go back, as you go back down to your home, back to the place where they are for war, but you are for peace. As you go, you go knowing that you were not leaving the blessing of God and the blessedness that you had in Jerusalem. You go knowing that God is not merely the God of Zion, but he is the God who made heaven and earth. And that means, brothers and sisters, that there is no place, no circumstance, no problem that can overtake you as the people of God. For you, dear Christian, like this pilgrim is told, the one who made heaven and earth will never be hindered from giving you his wonderful blessing. And this is something for us to ever reflect upon, brothers and sisters. We must never forget in all of the warped world's hostility, in all of our own failings in our lives, in all of the enemy's attempts and harassment, we must never forget that our great God, and Savior and King, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Oh, the joy is overwhelming. It's glorious. And this pilgrim goes, knowing forever the blessing of the Lord, even as we come and go Lord's Day by Lord's Day. And as we do so, let us go and rejoice. Even may we be overwhelmed by the love and the blessing of our great King Jesus. And as a minister in his church, I say to you all, may the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. And as we go, brothers and sisters, 
We go knowing the blessing of the Lord and the promise of the Lord. Those two most wonderful things. Oh, what comfort and encouragement. And one last thing. Listen to this last thing. For it is our future, dear Christian. In Revelation 22, we read this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. What a glorious promise brothers and sisters. May we go, even as we descend back into our lives from spiritual Mount Zion, may we always remember those two very important things for our survival and for our peace, the blessing of the Lord and the promise of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we, we delight to give you praise Lord, we are overwhelmed and awed at your love towards us. Who are we that you are mindful of us? But Lord, we praise you that out of your own good pleasure, you have set your love upon us and you have sought us. You have found us and you have given us life in Christ. We pray, Father, even through the ups and downs and the insanity of this world that seems so prevalent, that we would never forget the love that we've been shown and the mercy that we've been shown. And may we extend that to others out of gratitude, out of love for you, out of love for Christ. May we reflect the love of him to whom we belong, our Redeemer Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would help us to have a growing understanding of the reality that we are united to Christ and that we are dead to sin and alive to walk in newness of life. Oh, Father, help us to walk in newness of life. Lord, we do pray that you would continue to bless us as we descend back and go into our, uh, our pilgrim life, Lord. We pray that, you would, uh, that we would go knowing that you are ever with us and that we carry that blessing even to the end of our days into glory. We thank you and we love you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.